Hello everyone and welcome to the Life in the Universe pandemic series, uh, some short ideas and discussions about life in the universe. And today's question that I want to talk about is this, why is everyone so excited about Europa? Europa is of course a, a moon of the giant gas planet Jupiter. A few decades ago, if you'd asked someone about the possibility of life elsewhere in our solar system, they would have got very excited about the planet Mars, and they would have spoken about uh, Percival Lowell's delusions of canals on the surface of that planet, servicing a desiccating, dying Martian civilization, through to more modern ideas, which is to search for evidence of microbial life on Mars, if there's anything there at all. And that would have been the end of the discussion. Mars was the only planet that was thought to be suitable for life. Uh, it would have been crazy uh, a few decades ago to have suggested that one place to look for life might be the outer regions of the solar system, perhaps uh, bodies out there uh, beyond Jupiter and Saturn in the frozen wastelands of the giant gas planets. But then in the 1970s, the Pioneer spacecraft and the Voyager spacecraft, really remarkable missions, headed out into the outer solar system, taking images of the giant gas planets and the moons. And one of the things that they discovered is that these planets have orbiting around them many rocky worlds, rocky moons, a little bit like our own moon, but smaller, uh, but essentially made of cratered ancient rocks. But in amongst those rather uninteresting objects, or at least uninteresting from a biological point of view, they spied uh, moons with a very different um, set of characteristics. And one of those was Europa. Uh, it wasn't the first time Europa was observed. Europa was observed by Galileo. That is why it is one of the four Galilean moons, Europa, Io, uh, Ganymede and Callisto. But what the spacecraft saw for the first time is that these were not just rocky moons like our own moon, but they were very different indeed. And this is a picture of what the um, pioneer and Voyager spacecraft saw, and latterly the Galileo spacecraft. Europa is an icy moon that has very few craters on its surface. In fact, the surface looks very modern compared to, say, our own moon. There's one or two obvious craters. Otherwise, otherwise it's almost completely flat, like a billiard ball. And that told the observers that these moons had surfaces that were quite recent not ancient at all. In fact, active geology occurring on these moons. More remarkable is that the surface of these moons is icy white. They reflect radiation, uh, and so this tells us that these moons are covered in, in ice. The ices are not completely clear white. Uh, they have these orangey and red uh, mottled colorations that you can see again in this picture. You can see the mottled uh, orange and red colors which may be caused by salt on the surface of that ice being irradiated, possibly even organic material, organic material that's being processed in the intense radiation environment of uh, the, the European surface. These moons were remarkable because they were very different from rocky moons, but there was also something interesting about them, um, other than their icy surfaces. They also had their own magnetic fields, induced magnetic fields, and the best way to understand this is to think about what happens when you go to an airport and you walk through a metal detector. If you walk through a metal detector with a uh, conducting object on you, what will happen is that object will, will move through the magnetic field of the metal detector and it will induce its own small magnetic field and that will set off the alarm. So too, as Europa moves through Jupiter's magnetic field, so it induces a magnetic field. And that tells us that within Europa is something conductive. And that was the first indication that these moons might, con might contain conductive material of some sort that was later inferred to be salty water or an ocean. Uh, now there is all sorts of circumstantial evidence uh, for, and direct evidence, I should say, for uh, oceans beneath the surface of Europa, not just the magnetic field, but measurements of the, uh, the bulk density of those moons and the distribution of density in those moons. Uh, people also think that they can see plumes of water emanating from the surface of Europa that may have come from a deep subsurface ocean. Now, this moon is, is small compared to our own planet. It's about the same size as our own moon. And most people would be surprised if they found out that such a moon contained large quantities of liquid water that could be of interest to astrobiologists. But remarkably, some people have calculated that, that Europa 
could contain uh, two times as much as all the Earth's oceans combined. How is that possible? Well, on the Earth, you have to remember that the oceans are spread out across the surface of our planet, and they're relatively thin. In fact, in the deepest place, it's about 11 kilometers deep. That may sound uh, like a very deep ocean to you and I, at least on our scale, but that's actually a rather thin veneer of water spread out across the surface of the planet. In Europa, the ocean uh, may be 100 kilometers or more deep. And as a result, even though the moon is not uh, much different from the size of our own moon, you can pack a lot of water into there, about as much water as two times all the Earth's oceans uh, combined. Could there be anything living in these oceans? Well, we don't know, but what's exciting is here we have an extraterrestrial ocean. Now we really are talking about extraterrestrial oceanography. So people have all sorts of ideas about what they might do to explore Europa for signs of life. One way is to land on the surface and to see whether any of that ocean water has come spewing up to the surface of that moon, which you could sample and look for life. And indeed, if you look at the surface of Europa, you can find all sorts of line-like features on the surface that you can see there, and also chaos terrain that you can see there. And these uh, line features are formed from gravitational flexing of the moon. So the first question we should address is, how is it that a moon in the frozen, frigid wastelands of the outer solar system could have an ocean? Uh, on the Earth, of course, our oceans are maintained by our, our atmosphere, that warms the surface of the Earth and, of course, receives enough solar radiation to keep uh, ice in a liquid state. How is that possible out uh, on a moon in orbit around Jupiter? Well, the moon itself is tidally locked, and that means that it's always facing towards Jupiter. The same face is facing towards Jupiter as it rotates around the planet. But in fact, it's not perfectly tidally locked because there are other moons in orbit around Jupiter as well, like Ganymede and Callisto. And as a result, Europa is always being perturbed by the gravitational influences of these other moons. We say that the moons are in resonance. Their gravitational interactions um, influence each other. And what this means is that Europa is never perfectly tidally locked as it goes around Jupiter. It's always being rocked from side to side by these uh, tidal interactions with the other Jovian moons. And the result of that is that the interior of the moon is essentially warmed up. If you take a fork or a spoon and you bend it, uh, you will remember that if you do that, it starts to get hot and eventually it will break. The same thing with Europa. As you buckle the moon through these giant tidal interactions with Jupiter and the other Jovian moons, slowly but surely it warms up in the inside and that warmth melts the ice and creates an internal ocean. So those tidal interactions are what makes possible an ocean uh, deep inside Jupiter. And that tidal buckling is also fracturing that ice crust that covers the ocean. And as the ice crust flexes and contorts, we think that lines on the surface of Europa reflect these fractures through the crust caused by tidal buckling. And if those fractures are connected with the ocean beneath, then we could infer that as the moon buckles and these fractures move, move open and closed, that ocean water might be spewed up onto the surface of the moon. And so one way to explore Europa for life would be to land on the surface near one of these fractures to sample that material and see if it contains life. That would be an extraordinarily ambitious mission. And we would also want to be um, exploring material that was relatively recent, because you can imagine that if some of that material came up onto the surface and was exposed to the intense um, radiation field of, of Jupiter, uh, then a lot of that material would be destroyed, particularly if it contained biology. So we want to get to nice, fresh material. Uh, another way is to drill into Europa's ocean and send a craft deep into the ocean to see if we can find life. And that, again, is a very ambitious uh, mission. It might involve uh, melting through kilometers of ice to get into the European ocean. But one of the tantalizing uh, things about the surface of Europa is chaos terrain like this. This is some chaos terrain that you can see here. And the chaos terrain is also um, one feature that might suggest that the surface uh, of Europa is in some places very close to the ocean. We also see lent uh, these lenticulae, which are uh, areas of subdued terrain on Europa where the ice has essentially become flattened. 
and that could suggest there is heat coming up from just beneath the surface of Europa and melting the surface of the ice. In other words, in some places on the, on the European surface, the ocean may not be um, very deep beneath that surface crust. And those may be easier places to drill through the surface and try and look for life uh, on that moon. Well, is the European ocean uh, habitable or inhabited? We simply don't know. We don't know much about uh, the chemistry of the European ocean. We know it's salty, but we don't know whether it's made up of, say, magnesium sulfate or sodium chloride or a mixture of those, or whether it's got other types of salts in there as well. And these things will affect whether that ocean can support life. For example, if it's really salty and it's got the wrong types of salts in, like magnesium and chloride ions, um, the water in the ocean, although the ocean is watery, the water may not be available for life. It may have a very low uh, water activity, as we say. We also don't know whether there are sufficient concentrations of nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, carbon compounds, and all the other good things that life needs to be able to construct itself or to be able to grow and reproduce. It could be that Europa's ocean is a giant water body that is completely uninhabitable. It could also be that Europa has an ocean that is habitable, but there's no life in there. It could be a place where the origin of life never occurred or life was never transferred into that ocean from some other planet, for example, the Earth, that does have life. So we could be looking at a moon that has a very large ocean that is suitable for life, but is completely uninhabited. And those in themselves would be interesting um, discoveries. If we found that Europa was uninhabited and uninhabitable, in other words, the ocean uh, was not capable of supporting life, that would be tremendously interesting because it would tell us that there may well be many watery ocean worlds out there in the universe uh, that are completely unsuitable for life. If we found that Europa's ocean was habitable but had no life, that might tell us throughout the universe there are uh, ocean worlds, icy worlds uh, that harbour oceans that are suitable for life, but that the origin of life is extremely rare and most of these oceans are completely lifeless. So the search for life on Europa is not some uh, overdeveloped, overenthusiastic uh, quest for trying to find biology. Looking at Europa's ocean will tell us fundamental things about whether uh, ocean worlds are habitable and whether they contain life. And that in itself will give us new perspectives on life throughout the universe. Europa is not the only uh, moon orbiting Jupiter that we think has a deep ocean. Uh, Ganymede, which is further out from Europa, has a more ancient pockmarked surface from asteroid and comet impacts. But we think that that moon too also has a deep ocean. Although instead of being in contact with a rocky core like Europa, the ocean in Ganymede, or oceans as the case may be, may be sandwiched between layers of high pressure ice. So we don't know what sort of oceans might be in Ganymede and how they compare to Europa. And Callisto, which is the furthest Galilean moon out, uh, also has an induced magnetic field, suggesting that deep in the interior of that moon is an ocean. One of the interesting things about Callisto is that its surface is very ancient. Unlike uh, Europa, which is much more tidally buckled because it's closer to Jupiter, uh, Callisto has a very ancient surface that's very stable. And some people have suggested that even though we might not want to search for life on Callisto and send an astrobiology mission there, we may want to establish a human base on the surface of that moon. Given the stable, uh, ancient, uh, cratered surface of Callisto, uh, some have imagined that we could even have refueling stations on the surface of Callisto, servicing deep space human missions heading out to the outer solar system, like Neptune and Pluto, maybe even human interstellar missions heading out beyond our own solar system to explore distant stars. We'd stop off in Callisto, uh, grab a bite to eat, fuel up their spacecraft, and maybe uh, take part in some expeditions, robotic expeditions, to explore the oceans of Europa. So the Jovian system, the system of Jupiter, is a tremendously exciting place for biologists. We don't know whether there's life there. It's going to be enormously challenging to test the hypothesis of life in the, in the Jovian system because of the difficulties of landing on those moons, uh, getting samples, testing them for life, and the added difficulty of drilling beneath the surface of Europa into the ocean itself. But nevertheless, uh, now we know that there are oceans there and it opens up the thrilling prospect 
of extraterrestrial oceanography, something that would have been outlandish, an outlandish suggestion um, a few decades ago. And in the next few decades and centuries, I've no doubt we will explore uh, Europa and we will find out whether there is life in that ocean. And in doing so, we will learn a great deal more about the conditions for life, the conditions for the origin of life, and also probably gain remarkable new insights into the possibilities of uh, habitable conditions and maybe even life in some of the uh, frozen wastelands of solar systems that were once thought to be um, completely inhospitable to biology. So that's the Jovian system. And in future Life in the Universe pandemic series lectures, I'll tell you about the moons of Saturn that are also interesting, Enceladus and Titan, where we think that there are other subsurface oceans that could be explored. So thank you very much again for joining me. Uh, take care of yourselves during this pandemic.